Good morning, Bayshore. Happy New Year. Let's stand and worship together.
Amen. Good morning and welcome to Bayshore. Really glad that you guys decided to join us this morning. Um, this is a time in our service, uh, and, I, and I just want to, I've said this before, I want to kind of reiterate that uh, everything that we do is worship. And it's not just the music, it's uh, also giving, it's also as we observe Lord's Supper, it's also as we open God's Word and learn from it. All of that is a part of an act of worship. And so even is our time of fellowship and greeting. And so this is a time in our service where we uh, find one another that we haven't seen in a minute, that we, we shake hands, we greet one another. Um, and I know that some of you like this less than others. And uh, some of you are introverts. And if you're a guest with us this morning, we don't desire to embarrass you in any way. Uh, we're not going to parade you up here. I still think it's funny. Uh, growing up in uh, kind of small town Louisiana church, uh, we literally used to say, the pastor would get up and say, if you're a guest with us, will you please stand? And just had the guests stand up and everybody would just clap for the guests. And I just cannot imagine how an introvert would feel. I would be like, I'm right here, woo! Uh, and some of you might be that way, and that's fine too. But uh, this is a, a great time that we enjoy fellowship together. And so will you stand to your feet, find someone that you haven't seen in a while, shake a hand, hug a neck, welcome to Bayshore. As you make your way back, as you make your, check, 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 it's my mic, am I going to work, there we go, as you make your way back to your seats, um, I hate to interrupt good, good fellowship, um, but as you make your way back, back to the seats, we're going to um, observe a time of the Lord's Supper together, and um, I always want these times to be um, 
reverent, but I always want to just take an opportunity to explain and to teach and to remind us exactly why it is that we uh, observe this thing called the Lord's Supper, or some may call it communion. Uh, so slightly different approach this morning. If you have your Bible, um, or if not, you can grab the one in the, the pew back in front of you. I'm not going to read a ton of scripture. I actually want to take us to the chapter we're, we're going to be in today and for the next several weeks, and I want to point out a few things um, that I think lead us well into a time of communion. It's Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And uh, it's okay to use the table of contents. If, if, uh, if you're new to the church, there's a table of contents in the front. Um, if you flip toward the back, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then Romans, you'll find Romans toward the back. Um, Romans 8 teaches a ton about the Holy Spirit if we pay attention. And I, I want to share just a little bit this morning about our communion with and through the Holy Spirit of God. And Baptists um, historically are not great about talking about the Holy Spirit and his work in our lives and, and in and through us. Um, but Romans 8 teaches us quite a bit. If you look at verse 9, uh, verse 9 says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ, distinct but in communion with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So here he is the divine giver of life and freedom. That's the Holy Spirit. Verse 11, look at verse 11. It says, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So there, He is the one who raised Jesus from the dead, and He will likewise raise us from the dead. We will receive resurrection bodies if we are in Christ, if we have this communion with the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So he is the one by whom we die to sin and live to holiness. Verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. The Holy Spirit leads us. And lastly, look at verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into, into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit is the one in whom we have communion with God. He is the one who binds us to God in Christ. I want you to notice the, the contrast. You did not receive the spirit of fear to fall back into slavery. You did not receive that spirit. You did receive the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ, the spirit of life, the spirit of adoption. This is the Holy Spirit that we've received. So the first thing to notice about communion here is the reception of the Holy Spirit. I want each one to ask themselves, have you received the Holy Spirit? And this is a singular Holy Spirit. There is not a spirit of Christ and a spirit of God and a spirit of life and a spirit of adoption. This is the Holy Spirit. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Ask yourself, when did you receive the Holy Spirit? And if you're wondering, can I be sure? Am I sure that I received the Holy Spirit? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today in the message. The second thing I want you to notice, uh, besides our reception of the Holy Spirit, is our reaction to the Holy Spirit our reaction to the Holy Spirit. It is by Him that we cry, Abba, Father. It is by Him that we're able to say that. It is by His Spirit indwelling us that we even desire to say that, that we even know to do so. So our past reception of the Holy Spirit, our receiving of the Holy Spirit, leads us in a present reality of calling on God. He is the one that does that through us. We were children of wrath, and now we are adopted children of God. That's what we're claiming, at least in part, 
So as we observe the Lord's Supper, it means that we're adopted children. It means that we have one claim, that we are saved by one spirit, that we have the blood of one Savior, Jesus Christ, that saves us. It means that we have allegiance to one God. And we receive this communion representing one body. As we do this today, we're not just doing this in this room. We are in part joining with the global church, all who have received this, all who make this claim, all who have received this one spirit. We are uniting ourselves, not only understanding that we are united with God through the spirit, but we are united to one another, brothers and sisters across the globe, and not only across the globe, but throughout all time, for centuries past. I want us to understand that as we do this, the, the bread that we partake we're understanding that that is symbolic of Jesus' body that was broken for our sin. And as we receive this juice, and, and some churches do wine, we, we use juice. But the, the point is that the grape was crushed. It was crushed. And Jesus was crushed for our iniquity. So the juice that comes out of the grape is symbolic of the blood that was spilled on our behalf. So we have this assurance and this confidence that we have peace with God, that we have been made acceptable to God, and that we belong to God's everlasting family, and that we have communion with him and one another in Christ by the Spirit of God. Now, I'll briefly tell you that a, a couple of things that, that you need to make sure that you think about is that you examine yourself and that you know that you have, in fact, received the Holy Spirit, that you have in fact trusted Christ for salvation. If you've not done so, we would ask you not to partake of communion this morning. The Bible says that we should not eat and drink in an unworthy manner, but that we should examine ourselves. And so even if you have trusted Christ, but if you are harboring sin against a brother or sister in Christ or someone that, that you know that you should make things right with, if you're harboring sin that you've not confessed to God, that we ask you not to partake of communion this morning. Now, some churches observe an open communion and they say very little, if any, of the things that I've said and just anyone can partake anytime they like. Other churches observe a very strict closed communion, which means you have to be a member of this church. I like what we might call a close communion. If you are not a member of this church, but you have trusted Christ and you've examined yourselves and, and you have no uh, sin that you are harboring or holding on to or living in without confessing that to the Lord, we invite you to take because you are part of God's family. So the deacons will come up now and we will observe communion together.
Heavenly Father, as we, as we hold this bread in our hand, I ask that we think truly what it represents, truly the broken body that Jesus experienced before he was hung on that cross as well as after. Lord, I can't imagine the pain and the suffering. Now to think about when Jesus asked, take this cup from me if you can. The cup wasn't taken. And Jesus went through with it knowing. Lord, I thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Scripture says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that, Lord, I thank you for being justified and reconciled through the blood of Christ. I pray that when we partake of the Lord's Supper, that it isn't just something we do out of because it just happens, but it's a heart change and it's a remembrance of what you did for us on the cross and shedding your blood. Father God, let's, let us... <clears throat> Let us do this in remembrance of you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Scripture says, And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, 
For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for their forgiveness of sins.
Father, will you teach us this morning by your word? Would you give me clarity of speech? And would you give all of the hearers clarity of mind and of heart? Lord, would you change us by your spirit, by your word? We ask it in the powerful and majestic name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Um, so it seems that I have, um, some of you may not know this, but it, it seems that I have been challenged by one Chris Salazar on whether or not Romans chapter 8, and I warned him this was coming, <clears throat> Romans chapter 8 being the greatest chapter in all of Scripture. And over the next several weeks, uh, we're going we're gonna to walk through Romans 8. This morning, I'm going to give you an overview, more or less to prove Chris wrong. Um, no, I'm kidding. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, great theologian, love him as an author and a theologian. He said, whatever chapter a preacher is expounding should be the greatest chapter ever. And I find that to be true of myself. Um, when, when we were walking through the story of Joseph, I was just all in on the story of Joseph. And uh, when we were in Lamentations, some of you were like, Lord, get us out of Lamentations. But I was just eating it up. I, you know, whatever I'm studying, whatever I'm reading, um, that does often become the, the greatest chapter or the greatest book or the greatest section. But here are my reasons, uh, and I'll get these out of the way uh, quickly here at the beginning. The reasons, Chris, <laughs> that chapter 8 is the greatest is it sets forth the gospel. It sets forth the plan of salvation. It shows new life of freedom and victory. It shows the hopelessness of our sin nature, righteousness of being born again, the indwelling Christ and the Holy Spirit. It gives us bodily resurrection, hope of Christ's return, the glorious truth that God works all things together for our good. And that is why it's the greatest chapter. On top of that, we're only going to be in Romans chapter 8. I'm not going to take you anywhere else in Scripture. So if you'll open your Bibles there, we will stay there um, all of today. It's got everything that we need. As a matter of fact, it's got so much that I even led the Lord's Supper from Romans chapter 8. Does John chapter 3 do that? <laughs> I'm teasing, I'm teasing. An outline of Romans chapter 8 is, it's, it's really difficult to outline because every argument is so tightly woven. And that is... That is just indicative of the Apostle Paul and his writings. Everything that he says, it just ties into itself and it ties back to something else and it ties to something that he's about to say and it's so intricately woven together that it's really difficult to outline. But I've committed to doing uh, what I'm calling 8 and 8. We're doing 8 sermons in Romans chapter 8. Now, I reserve the right to count this overview as one or not. We might do eight more. This might be like Romans overview, and then we might do eight and eight. All right, I'm still deciding whether or not uh, Romans eight twenty eight, which happens to be my favorite verse probably in all of scriptures, as well as my daughter Key. She loves Romans eight twenty eight, and it's just a fantastic verse. And I'm thinking about devoting one whole sermon just to that. And so we might have eight more. This might be number one. I'm not sure yet. But as we look at it, uh, the first thing I want us to see uh, as we're trying to outline this is five assurances of salvation. This is where we're going to spend the, the, the bulk of our time this morning is, is five assurances of salvation that we find in Romans chapter 8. Toward the end, I, I've got two little subsections that will become sermons in full toward the end of our series. Um, or I'm sorry, three little subsections, but um, five assurances. That's where we're going to spend the bulk of our time. Number one, assurance that you have salvation. And I referenced this earlier in um, when we were observing communion. Um, you know, can you be sure? And, and maybe you're sitting here today going, I sometimes feel sure of my salvation and sometimes I don't feel sure of my salvation and I'm not sure that I'm sure all of the time. Um, I don't know who first said it. I've heard it several times. I thought it was the preacher that I grew up listening to. I say grew up. Seventh, eighth grade is when I started going to church. But um, his name was Brother Dick Page. And Brother Page was, um, uh, you know, uh, he was a preacher. I don't know. I don't know what to say about Brother Page. But he had a lot of uh, euphemisms, a lot of analogies, a lot of little sayings and quips and things like that. And, and I remember him saying, do you know that you know that you know? 
And I thought that was his, and then I've heard it from other places. But, but the question remains, do you know that you know that you know? Are you assured of your salvation? And so one assurance of salvation, one way that you can know, is right here in Romans chapter 8, the penalty. And, and, and here's the deal. Um, I'm calling this five assurances or five proofs of salvation. Five proofs of salvation. I'm backing up just a little bit. Just put it in reverse. We're going backwards. Okay, five proofs of salvation. There's a P. I don't do alliteration often, but when I do, buddy, I go all in, okay? So we've got like all of these P's this morning. So five proofs of salvation or assurances. Number one is the penalty. There's your P. The penalty of our sin is removed, leaving no condemnation. No condemnation. Look at verse one. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. With that phrase, Paul begins one of the greatest chapters in the Bible. Essentially, verse 1 says everything that the rest of the chapter declares. It kind of sums it all up. I mean, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I could probably preach two or three sermons just on that. We could, we could just preach on that and be done. And you say, amen, let's go home. It says everything the rest of the chapter declares. There is no condemnation, nor will there ever be condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. For those in Christ Jesus. That's the union that we talked about last week, I think. The union that we have with Christ. Are you in Christ If you are, there is no condemnation. We have perfect and eternal security in Christ. Just quickly, we'll get there in a minute, but just quickly look down at verse 39, the very last verse uh, in in Romans chapter 8. I'm sorry, not the very, yeah, it is the very last verse. Is the very last verse? Yeah. Um, 39 says that nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ. In Christ. Now, if you just want something fun to do, and, you know, fun coming from a pastor, I don't know how much fun you'll think it is, but go through just Romans chapter 8 and just look at in Christ, in Him, in the Spirit. Like, just, just look at those things. And that, it talks deeply about our union with Christ. And we find out that there is no condemnation and no separation from God for those who are in Christ. Our union with Christ is extremely important. Now, I spent... Years and years in student ministry, and I love the phrase, and and probably somewhere somebody thinks that I created this phrase. I just don't know where I got it. Um, But when you see therefore in Scripture, you're supposed to ask, what's it there for? Thank you, all six of you who knew that. The therefore uh, ties what he's saying not really to the, just the preceding statements in the end of chapter 7. It really ties what he's saying and what he's about to say to the whole first half of the book. The whole first half of the epistle. The first seven chapters, uh, he creates these arguments. I'll br- briefly tell you those in just a second. But, but he creates these uh, dichotomies going round and round. And, and when he says therefore, he's really summing all of that up. All of the first seven chapters. You should read it, the first seven chapters. But I want to get to why. Why is there no condemnation? If that's an assurance of salvation, you need to know why there is no condemnation. Look at verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. You've been set free through Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life has set you free. He set me free. Is that true of you? Have you been set free? Are you free from the law of sin and death? Have you been made free? Now, the opposite of free might be summed up as condemned. And most of us don't really know what it feels like to be under the condemnation of the law. Like to stand condemned before the court. Most of us may not know what that feels like. And and I don't know that I can make you understand what that feels like because I don't fully know what that feels like. But can you imagine just for a moment, if you were to just think of your sins, those that are the most atrocious, the most egregious, 
If you were to think for a moment of those sins and you were to imagine just for a split second those sins just popped up over your head so that everybody could see. And if they were read aloud, if I could read your minds and I could read your sins aloud, and if God were sitting right here and he looks at you and he says, guilty. That's heavy. It's heavy to stand under this condemnation, to even imagine what this condemnation feels like. But guilty was, prior to Christ, our status. And without Christ, it is our status. That's who we are. We are guilty. The dichotomies that I talked about in the first seven chapters that that I hope you go and read, um, he sets these things up where he goes, uh, sin versus righteousness. He goes, law versus grace. He sets all of these things up. He's got another, slavery versus freedom. On and on and on. Uh, There's death versus life. There's condemnation versus justification. And and it seems as if the Apostle Paul is just going to continue round and round and round, wrapping up more and more of these these dichotomies. And he can't go over, go on and on forever in some kind of infinite theological loopy tango he's got to at some point bring all of this to a close and that's how he ties it up right here there's no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus look at verses 3 and 4 for God has done what the law now pause for a second because there may be some in the room that when you hear law you think you know speeding or you know the the law of the land and that's not exactly what we're talking about here When we see, for God has done what the law couldn't do. We'll continue reading in a minute. But the law was made, in a sense, to keep us in line. Or really to show that we couldn't stay in line. That we couldn't live up to God's commands. Not fully, not perfectly. So so when you see that, I want you to understand what was created to try to keep us in line. Or at least show that we couldn't be kept in line. So God has done what that, the law, weakened by the flesh, because we couldn't do it, weakened by the flesh, could not do. The law couldn't do it. And he did so by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. That's the incarnation that we talked about, that we learned about in Christmas, around Christmas time. We talk about it all the time. By sending his own son in the likeness of human flesh, sinful flesh, sorry, and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. The flesh of Jesus, he condemned sin in the flesh. Verse 4, in order that, why did he do it? In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. We receive the righteous requirement. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Those who've received the Spirit are no longer bound by the law, the requirements, having to be kept in line. Christ kept it for us. Jesus died for us, bearing the wrath of God in our place so that now there is no condemnation. Now, I'm going to pause right here. Most of the time, I kind of give you the gospel at the end of the message. I just want to tell you right now, In the beginning of the message, I just want to tell you, everyone in this room is a sinner. Everyone in this room, apart from Christ, deserves God's eternal wrath and punishment. That's what Scripture tells us. Everyone in this room will stand condemned before God for even the smallest, I'm doing quote fingers, smallest sin. Because it's not about the size of your sin, but it's about the holiness of God. And so everyone in this room, apart from Christ, deserves God's wrath. Eternal separation from God. That's what you deserve. But Jesus Christ took on human flesh, bonding himself to our humanity, lived the life that we couldn't live perfectly before God, upholding all of the law, lived that perfect life, and went to the cross, and all of the The wrath and punishment for my sin and your sin was put on Jesus at the cross. So when he was buried, that sin was buried with him. And when he resurrected, guess what? He was God already, so he resurrected without it. And he offers you salvation. He says, I lived the perfect life. 
I died the death that you deserve, and you can have salvation through me. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So you're in one of two positions here today. We'll continue in just a moment, but you're, you're in one of two positions. You're either in the position of you are under wrath or you are under grace. If you're under wrath, then that verse is not true of you. That there is no condemnation because you're not in Christ Jesus. But if you are in Christ Jesus, and we'll continue talking about the assurances so you can kind of work that out for yourself. But, but if you are in Christ Jesus, then you are not under wrath. You are under God's grace. Assurance number one. Proof number one is that the penalty has been removed. Number two, we are given the power to resist sin. The power to resist sin. We do so by receiving a new nature, by being regenerated. Look at verses 8 through 10. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. You have the power to resist sin. Not only is the condemnation, sin's penalty, averted, but we've also been saved from ourselves. Who we are by nature. By nature, we are sinners. But by spirit, we can be saved from that. We can resist. In Christ, we can resist. You might have a sin that you're going, man, I have tried and tried and tried to kick this particular thing, and I can't. I cannot seem to, it won't let go of me. Can, can, I, can I give you a little bit of assurance? If you're fighting, that is not your sin nature. You're fighting by the Spirit. Your sin nature doesn't want to fight sin. It wants to lay down in it. If you are fighting, I, I would have teenagers come and sit in my office as, when I was a student pastor, and they would just weep and crying over sins that teenagers deal with. And I would say, you know what? The fat, your tears tell me that the Holy Spirit indwells you. I, I mean, I can't know another person's salvation. Not really. But when I see someone struggling with sin, fighting sin, I go, that's God. That's not of you. That's God. So there's an assurance there that we have the power to resist and we seek to resist. And sometimes we fail and we don't resist. But we desire to. If you have, in fact, been saved, you have been regenerated. You have been given this new life, and this is marvelous, and it's terrifying. It's terrifying in that if you're not living by the power of the Spirit, if you're not fighting sin, then you might not be a Christian. I don't want to scare anybody out of their salvation, but if you actually have salvation, I can't scare you out of it. So if you feel scared and terrified right now, you might ought to ask whether or not you truly have salvation. It's pretty clear. Look at verses 13 and 14. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Are you led by the Spirit of God? If so, then you're a child of God. Are you seeking to put to death the sins of the flesh? A lot of people are living by the flesh and claiming they have the Spirit. And to those of you who might be in earshot of me hearing that, I would say you need to check yourself. You need to make sure. You need to think about that. Do you hate sin? Do you fight sin? You have the power to resist sin. Number three, our position has been changed. So the, the penalty of sin has been removed. The power to resist sin we now have. Our position has been changed. We are adopted sons and daughters. Look at 15 and following. 15 says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. 
The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Pause. We are adopted. Not only are we saved from sin's penalty, the no condemnation. Not only do we have the power to fight sin, having our natures be, having been re- regenerated. But we are also given a new position, a new standing, a, a new title before God. We went from wicked, condemned God-haters, enslaved to sinful rebellion, to being in Christ. To being in Christ. We are adopted children who now get to affectionately call on God as our Father. Can you fathom that? The creator God of the universe, we get to say, Father. Instead of going, God, we now say, Father. So in that, uh, we, we get to bring our, our deepest questions and our most painful hurts and our most pressing needs before him. We have that ability now. Not on your own authority, but because of the authority of Christ. Our position has been changed. Number four, we've been promised future glory. We've been promised future glory. We have this promise. Look, uh, picking up in 17, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and read a little bit. I'm going to start in 17. I kind of stopped halfway through. If children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Here's where I stopped. Provided we suffer with him in order that we also be glorified with him. For I consider, Paul says, that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. The sufferings are small. And some of you suffer big. But Paul's saying they're nothing in comparison to the glory that will be revealed in us. If we suffer with Christ, we will be glorified with Christ. Continuing on, verse 19 No, I'm sorry, we're not in 19 yet. We'll we'll pick up 19 in a moment. If we are made a child of God, we are heirs of God with Jesus. We are bound up in him, with him, union with Christ in all of his glorious. But if we are going to receive that glorification, we are also bound with him in his rejection and in his reviling. And in his pain and in his suffering. For if we want his resurrection, we have to also suffer like him. That's what it says, provided we suffer with him. That we may also be glorified with him. These two things are intricately linked. Present suffering and future glory. This promise of future glory is linked to your present suffering. Are you suffering well for Christ? Paul goes on in in this section to to lift the matter of redemption to a cosmic level. He he talks about us, but, but then he takes it even bigger. Look at verse 19. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly. Creation didn't do anything to deserve it, but because of him who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. This shows that not only were we fallen and in need of regeneration, but so it is with all of creation. When Adam and Eve broke God's law, disobeyed God, and decided to to go out on their own, not only was their relationship, let's take Adam for example, not only was Adam's relationship with God in some ways marred, but so was his relationship with Eve. If you were to go back and look in Genesis chapter 3, what you see is God goes, Adam, what is this you've done? And he says, it's the woman that you gave me. (laughs) Just immediately blaming somebody else. And then he looks at Eve and Eve goes, it was the snake. Just blame one another. But not only was our relationship with God, uh, this vertical relationship, marred, but so was our horizontal relationships. But not only that, our relationship to creation. From the sweat of your brow, you'll now work the earth. Thorns and thistles it will produce. So creation 
was subjected to bondage as well. And it is in need of regeneration. And just as we are born again or recreated, so it is with the new earth. And we inherit that. We, we had a little meeting yesterday, a couple of us, to do a little bit of sermon review. And he doesn't even know this. But, but Greg said something that made me go back and rethink something and dig a little deeper. Because I had in my mind, I, and people talk about what is heaven like, and I, I don't know. I, I know of Revelation 21 and 22, and I love Revelation 21 and 22, but I, I love the picture of the garden pre-sin. And I just always think of, you know, Eden being recreated. But something that Greg said made me think, you know, I, I really think that that undercuts the gloriousness of the new heaven and the new earth that Revelation 21 and 22 talk about. I, this new heaven and new earth that will come down. Do I think there's going to be a garden? Sure. But oftentimes we think of a garden like this is not your grandma's garden, okay? This is probably more like, you know, a national park. This is a huge, beautiful, wonderful place. And, and I, I think that, yes, we'll have that and we'll have the new Jerusalem. I think we'll get all of that and we inherit those things. Fifth one, fifth and final. We have the constant prayer or intercession of the Holy Spirit. That's an assurance of salvation. That you have the, the constant prayer, intercession of the Holy Spirit. 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts, that's the Holy Spirit, knows what is the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The fifth and final reason that we can be assured of our salvation is the Holy Spirit's intercession. He speaks to the Father on our behalf. Now, this is not, this is not the Holy Spirit before God going, you know, God the Father, first person of the Trinity, they're really not that bad. You should really change your mind. They're, they're pretty okay people. I've hung out with them. This is not the Holy Spirit trying to change God's mind. They have the same mind. They are of one accord in the, the most intimate way possible. No, this is the Holy Spirit taking our feeble, inadequate mumblings of prayers and interpreting them appropriately to God according to His will. It's aligning our prayer with the heart and mind of God. The Holy Spirit does that for us. Do you ever not know what to pray? Are you ever in a situation where you're just like, I don't really know how to pray for this situation. Or maybe your heart is so heavy and so burdened that you just don't even have the strength to pray. Anybody? I'm the only one. Two of us. Thank you, Shauna. <laughs> you know, as I've gotten older, that's happened more often than not. Where I just don't exactly know what words to say. That I just sometimes don't really know how to put words together. Um, one time, a friend of mine was, um, he was a missionary in China. And, and I, I can't remember because this has been 20 years. But I got this weird email from him. And all I could decipher from the email was that he had been arrested by, you know, the Chinese authorities uh, for taking pictures. Of, he was on... He, he wasn't over there as a spy. He was just taking pictures of something, and he didn't realize it, but he was taking pictures of, like, a military base or something. I don't know. Anyway, he was arrested, and I, I got this weird email. I don't know how he got the email off before they took him away, but I got this email, and I didn't really know what to make of it, but I knew that he was in big trouble, and I didn't really know how to help him, and I didn't even know how to pray. What am I supposed to pray? God, would you help the prison walls fall down? Would you help him all of a sudden know how to speak Mandarin so fluently that he can witness to all of the guards? I didn't, I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know what to pray for. Help him escape from the jail? I don't know. And I just remember laying there and weeping. And this verse coming to mind. This verse coming to mind that the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. With groanings too deep for words. Because I didn't have words. All I had was groanings. And I just knew that the Holy Spirit understood that and was interpreting my prayers in accordance with the will of God. And oftentimes all I can pray is, God, help my will align with yours. This is what I would like to happen. But God, I want your will to be done. 
whatever your will is. Whatever I think that I want, really I want your will. So I'm asking the Holy Spirit, oftentimes I'm asking the Holy Spirit, would you just do what's right and help me be okay with it? That's oftentimes the way I pray. When we're, when we're younger, we just have maybe a, a narrower scope of life and understanding. We don't quite understand the complexities of situations and stuff. So maybe our prayers may become a little bit easier because we're younger and we don't see the grand picture. But as we get older, we start seeing the intricacies of a situation and we're like, I don't know what to pray. But, but God, it, here's what I'd like to happen. This is what I think would happen. But bring people along, support them. Let your will be done. Help my heart be okay with it. Help me see you working in this situation. Our prayers just change as we get older. But it's good to know that we don't have to have all of the right words in all of the right order all of the time. The Holy Spirit is always there to take exactly what we say, completely knowing our hearts and what we desire, and completely knowing the situation fully. And not only the situation, but exactly what's going to come to pass. And interpreting that, So that God's will is done, His glory is renowned, and we get in line with that. So the five assurances of salvation, the five proofs, the penalty has been removed, there's no condemnation. We have the power to resist by being regenerated. Our position has been changed into adopted children. We have been uh, given this promised future glory that we will inherit all things with Christ. And we have the constant prayer or intercession of the Holy Spirit. Now here's the the couple brief things at the end. I want to show you the reason I love verse 28 so much. The invincible purpose of God. The invincible purpose purpose of God. Look at verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For whom? For those who are called according to his purpose. You can turn that around. For those that are calling, for those who are called according to his purpose, all things work together for the good. Now, for their good, ultimately, eternally, yes, not always in the moment, but everything that happens God is orchestrating for his children, for his glory and your eternal good. It's one of the greatest claims in scripture and it has implications that run as deep as they do wide. And I implore you, I beg you, memorize this verse. But not only memorize it, like really learn to love it. I'm going to tell you why, just briefly. Why I think it's maybe one of the most powerful verses for you to memorize in scripture. If you were to come to me, and I don't know you very well, and something tragic has happened to you, I would not say to you, these are the things I would not say. I would not say, well, that was God's will. That's just painful. Was it God's will? Well, yes. But I'm not going to hit you with that. I'm not going to say, well, you know, God works all things for the good. I'm sorry that this tragic thing has happened, but... God works it all for the good. But can I tell you what it'll do if you get it down in your bones now? You'll know it then. You'll know that whatever tragic circumstances befalls you, you'll know God works all things for good. Those who love him and are called according to his purpose, you will know that. And then when we talk, we're talking on a deeper level. When you come and see me as your pastor and you come and say, this tragic thing has happened, I weep with you, I cry with you, but we both rejoice in the hope that God's got it. That's why you got to get to know that now. Don't wait till tragedy happens. Know it now. Get it down in your bones now. The truth of verse 28 finds its strength in God's preeminent means. There's your P, preeminent means, verses 29 through 30. His preeminent means. Some have called this the golden chain of five links. 29 and 30. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, that's that's about... Five or six or seven 30-pound theological terms. And I, 
I not only have gotten Chris against me thinking that this is the greatest chapter, but Ross also told me there's no way you can preach that in one sermon. <laughs> so I might, I don't, I don't know if I can. That's a, there's a lot there. When we get to it, I encourage you to come and, and just strap in and we'll, we'll see what happens. But there's that, the truth of, of verse 28, that God works all things for the good, finds its strength in the fact that these are the means by which God saves his people. He foreknew. And, and I know that there are some in this room and many, many, many great theologians that disagree with me here. And that's okay to be wrong. No, I'm just kidding. We can disagree on some stuff and we can still arm in arm walk through the doors of glory together. Amen? We can disagree on some things. And this is one of the things that we don't have to fight over. I'm tired of people fighting over it. But, but here's the deal. You can't say you don't believe it. You can't say, well, I don't believe in foreknowledge. I don't believe in predestination. It's in Scripture. You've got to believe it. You've got to believe something about it. Don't let it ever be that anyone from Bayshore goes, well, I don't believe in election. You've got to believe something about it. And so I encourage you to know what you believe. But God foreknew, and those whom he foreknew, he predestined. And those whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. It's a beautiful, beautiful couple of verses right there. And, and we're, we'll dive into them in a few weeks. But that is the... That is the, the preeminent means by which God saves. The last P, the last one. Here we go. Five primary questions. We're not gonna, I'm not going to read these. I'm just going to tell you the question. The, the 31 through 39 is where this is. It's the last verses of the chapter. Five primary questions. We, we said maybe that's fundamental questions or irrefutable questions, but I had to go with a P because when I alliterate, I go all in. Five primary questions. 31 asks the question, if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? Lots of people are against us. You might say lots of people are against you individually. Lots of people are against us as Christians. But the question isn't really, are they against us? The question is really, can they be? If God is for us, who can be against us? Can they win? Can they prevail if God is for us? No. No. If God is for us, then obviously not. There's no one that can really truly come against us. Verse 32 asks the question, If God didn't spare his own son but gave him up for us, will he not also give us all things? Without the gift of Christ and our union with him, we know well what we would get, what we deserve from God. We've talked about that. We would get the wrath of God. But since he's given us Jesus, his very best, the only begotten Son, the perfect sacrifice, if He's given us Jesus, would He not also give us lesser things like the earth to inherit and the grace to make it through? Yes, of course He would. He would not deny us any of those things if He's given us His best. Verse 33 asks the question, Who will bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. That's the last phrase. And without that last phrase, we would surely be doomed. Who would bring a charge against God's elect? Well, lots of people could bring a charge against you or me. Your own conscience can condemn you. But if Christ died for you, then there are no charges that stand. There are none that stand. Verse 34, who will condemn? If Jesus is God's son, if he truly did live a perfect life before the Father, if he truly did provide a substitutionary sacrifice... And if today he truly does sit at the right hand of God the Father on our behalf, then who will condemn? No one. There's no one that condemn. 35 through 39, there's a lot there. The, the question that is asked is who or what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Paul calls all the witnesses to the stand. I just want you to... You, you may not see these, but I'm, I'm in verse 36 and following. But these, these are the witnesses that he calls to the stand, essentially, to say, are these things going to separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. He says, death, life, angels, rulers, things present, things to come, powers, height, depth, anything in all creation. He calls, essentially, 16 witnesses that might stand in the way of us and God. And then he says, anybody, anything else in all of creation, is anything going to separate us from the love of God in Christ? 
Well, the resounding answer is no. The Apostle Paul rightly concludes that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. So I ask you this morning, those five questions. Is God for you? Is he for you this morning? Have you received Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you received him? Have your charges been erased by his sacrifice? Or do you stand guilty, condemned? Will you one day be separated from God for all of eternity? Or are you this morning united to him in Christ? The chapter starts with no condemnation. And it ends with no separation. And in the middle, we get no defeat. So I ask you, is that your claim this morning? Have you trusted this Jesus? Have you surrendered your life to him? The musicians are going to come back up and we're going to sing this final song. And it's called the response song or the invitation because you are invited to respond to the word of God. And, and there's nothing special or, or mystical or magical about these steps down here. We refer to them sometimes as an altar, and, and maybe that's to our own demise that we say altar. But if, if you want to come down here and, and pray, it, it's really more about this. It's posturing yourself before God. You can sit right where you are, or you can stand and sing. But if you feel like, you know what, I need to change something in my life, start by changing your posture before God and just come down here and pray and talk to him. But more important than anything else, if you have never trusted Jesus Christ for salvation, if you're not sure that you are in Christ, that you have been bound to him by the Holy Spirit, if you've never surrendered your life to Christ, I'm going to tell you how to do that. You pray and you say, God, I'm a sinner. And I need a Savior. And the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, that God raised him from the dead on the third day, if you believe that, you will be saved. It doesn't say you might be. It doesn't say you need to go learn a lot of theology. It doesn't even say that you need to get baptized or start giving your money or join a church. It says believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. I'm going to be right down here. I'm going to stand right here at this pew. And, and if you want to come pray with me about anything, I'm happy to pray with you. I don't have a more special connection to God than you do, but, but I'm happy to pray with you or for you. But if you want to come down here and confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord, and you've never done that before, I invite you to do that this morning. Let's pray. God, would you help us to surrender ourselves to you in whatever way your spirit leads us? Lord, if if there are those that need to turn their life over to you for the first time or or confess sin and turn back to you, Lord, I pray that your spirit would prompt them to do that. If there's someone that should surrender to uh, some form of ministry, missionary work, or or, uh, sharing their faith with their neighbors, God, I pray that you would prompt them to do that. Lord, if you would convict that Uh, someone needs to start giving or needs to repair a relationship. Lord, whatever it is that you see fit, God, I pray that you would do exactly as you see fit. And Lord, if there's anyone that needs to trust you today, I pray that that that's already happened, that they just prayed that prayer. And if they did, I ask that you give them boldness to come down here and just to tell me about it so that I can celebrate with them and pray with them. Lord, have your way among us, we ask in Jesus' name.
as, as you guys are seated, um, Chris is still going to do the announcements in just a moment. I, I want to ask for permission to, to bring a name to you to pray for. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to tell you all of the details, um, but would you, even now and this afternoon, um, the surgery is likely happening right now or in the next few moments, uh, but would you, would you pray for Trish and her husband? Um, there's, there's, Trish has been through a lot. And, uh, and not sure how much more she can take, but would you pray that the peace of God that passes all understanding would just surround her, be with the doctors and the nurses uh, and all of the, the staff and, and people uh, that maybe even Christian people would, would speak words of life and uh, light to her uh, as her husband undergoes this surgery uh, e even now or in the next few moments. I I've just prayed down here, and so if you will just... After the announcements this afternoon at lunch, after lunch, if, if you'll just continue to kind of keep the, those, that prayer just on your lips, um, it would be greatly appreciated. All right, uh, a couple of announcements. Um, in your bulletin, uh, it says that we would like to meet today to take down the Christmas decorations, but as you can see, they are mostly down. Uh, but we do have the big tree in front. If you, Some of you could stay for a few minutes, and so we could knock that out. Um, the chili contest is coming up. The chili cook-off is coming up on February 4th, and we have a sign-up sheet. Uh, we need judges and uh, participants for that. Um, and so uh, the other thing, uh, uh, community group. Uh, some community groups are meeting today, and then some will meet uh, next Sunday. So get with your leader to figure out which one that is. Um, and you'll notice that we did not uh, pass out the offering. We have set those up the offering plates on the table uh, if you'd like to give on your way out so I will uh, pray for the offering real quick and we will be dismissed dear Heavenly Father we uh, we lift up Trish and her family to you bring peace and comfort to the situation and be with the the doctors and the medical staff that are are leading that uh, operation Father, we thank you for, for all that you have done for us, all the uh, financial blessings you have given to us as a congregation. Uh, be with us so that we may steward it well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.